Welcome to Mortification of Spin, a casual conversation about things that count with Carl Truman and Todd Pruitt, a podcast of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. Let's join this week's conversation. Welcome to Mortification of Spin. My name is Carl Truman. I am a professor at Grove City College in beautiful Western Pennsylvania and a fellow at the Ethics and Policy Public Policy Center in DC. And I'm here as always with my one long-standing friend and co-host, the Right Reverend Todd Pruitt, uh, pastor of Covenant Presbyterian Church in Harrisonburg, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Virginia. Sorry. Virginia. Harrisonburg, Please Virginia. don't ever make that yeah, mistake again. you have again. bad memories of Pennsylvania, I know, <laughs> and described by no uh, by somebody no less than Megan Basham as a major pastor. How about that? Mm-hmm. I, believe, I believe we have free, fridge magnets or something with that. Uh, something like that. But I'm I'm not a fellow. No, no one will have not. me as a fellow. No. Well, there are. How can I get on that you know? bandwagon? Is there well, like, can I buy my way in somewhere? No, you you have to have talent, and that oh, could well. be a black black mark against you. I mean, point. that's not going to happen. There is a very worrying rumor going around Grove City campus at the moment, and this is mm-hmm. true. I was approached by a student about this the other day. Apparently, we do have a younger listenership. There are some guys on campus who listen to us. I thought mm-hmm. we just appealed to the the bald and the disillusioned mm-hmm. like ourselves. But these guys have actually bought, believe it or not, I believe, are going to buy some of those Todd Pruitt endorsed muscle shirts Absolutely. with our logo on them. So I can have the horrific vision of, of male armpit hair mm. in yeah. my classes mm-hmm. uh, and mm-hmm. connotations of you. So very, very mm. disturbing. Well, I'll tell you what will be more disturbing than that, Carl is discovering that maybe there are some students at Grove City who actually wax their armpits. Either way, you're going to know. And uh, um, I yeah, can't we tell. Try, we, we do try to discourage that among the male pop. <laughs> well, that's good. That's 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 a very good Something's thing. Something's going to be unimagined. Yeah. But yeah. I, I do anyway. want to encourage our listeners to, to pick up one of these outstanding garments. Um, Carl has said that the worst thing about being uh, in America, and now he is a, a citizen, by the way, is walking onto a plane and and the freedom with which American men walk in with um, wearing tank tops so that you can see their armpit hair and uh, shoes that expose their bare toes. And so there you have it. That's the worst of America. And he might be right. Yeah, he might be right. Well, that's enough about our friend Matt Yuzi, I guess, if he's <laughs> listening in. I should introduce our two guests today. Both, the, Yeah, the, 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 the conversation needs to go a yeah. better direction. Well, let's raise point. the conversation. Yeah. Uh, two guests today happen to be both personal friends of mine and colleagues at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Uh, first is uh, Ryan T. Anderson, who's been on the program before and uh, is now, of course, famous for being banned by Amazon. I am very envious <laughs> of Ryan that he managed to get himself banned, or at least one of his books banned from Amazon. Uh, since we last interviewed him when he was working at the Heritage Foundation, he's become president of the Ethics and Public Policy Center and is doing tremendous work there. And he's accompanied by uh, one of his colleagues, uh, Alexandra De Sanctis, who is a fellow at the EPPC, and was described to me by uh, her former uh, professor and a friend of mine, Philip Munoz, at the University of Notre Dame as uh, the rising pro-life voice of her generation. Hmm. It's great to have Ryan and Alexandra. And one other thing I'd say about Alexandra is I love house guests who bring bottles of alcohol. Uh, and when she and her husband stayed, uh, now it was scope. Uh, it was a bottle of scope or Listerine, but nevertheless, <laughs> it was much better than that. So, <laughs> Alexandra and her husband can come and stay any time, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so, uh, uh, my wife is always complaining when when people bring gifts for you. And I say, well, you can drink it too. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> but um, anyway, great to have the two of you on, and uh, we want to talk to you about your new book or relatively recent book on abortion so welcome to the program thanks for having us thanks for having us so should i bring tea when i visit next time for your wife <laughs> tea um crumpets or something like that he likes uh, sauvignon blanc actually if you're gonna bring alcohol sauvignon bangers blanc and mash what, what it, you know haggis <laughs> that kind of thing basically any anything that's on the side of the road dead that the scottish will will steam up and and eat so that's what makes westminster pennsylvania such a wonderful place for the scots to live so 
your book was published uh, before, I think, the overturning of Roe v. Wade in the Dobbs decision. What has changed since the book came out that you think is significant, that the book anticipated, for example, or that the book will help uh, our listeners think through? Because clearly the lay of the land is very different now to what it yeah. was two years ago. The dynamic of the debate has shifted significantly. Uh, what would you say to somebody who would want to say, okay, how's your book going to help me in the new, the sort of the brave new post-row world in which we live? Yeah, no, great. Um, Alexander needs to correct me. I can't remember if the book was published three days before Dobbs came out or three days after. It was three Dobbs days after. Out. Three days after. But it was written before, or it was actually, it was written before we even knew the leak. I mean, we had submitted final edits to the publisher even before the leak came out. And I would say one thing we didn't anticipate when we wrote the book uh, was that we would actually have an, an entire draft Supreme Court opinion leaked from the Supreme Court. And then we would have the death threats, an assassination attempt when it came to Justice Kavanaugh, you know, all of the kind of like harassment of the court. Um, although we anticipated that because there's a chapter on how abortion has corrupted the judiciary, how it's corrupted the rule of law. We just didn't know it would go to these um, extremes. But in general, the answer to your question is um, Alexander and I wrote the book and we timed it to be released uh, when it was because we could count to five. We knew that we had five votes to finally overturn Roe v. Wade. Uh, we also knew we did not yet have five votes to go all the way with the John Finnis, Robbie George, 14th Amendment personhood. Right. So the Supreme Court wasn't going to declare abortion unconstitutional. It was going to return the question to the democratic process. And that meant, you know, the four of us, we need to be equipping our listeners, our readers, our families, our friends, our churches to then be able to make the argument to their friends, their neighbors, their families. Right. So, so the, the purpose of this book is really to be a one-stop shop to give you, um, you know, the, the subtitle of the book is How Abortion Harms Everything and Solves Nothing. And, you know, we kind of go through chapter by chapter, issue by issue of what abortion has harmed, how it hasn't solved the things that it promised to be a solution to, um, to give our readers, you know, a whole bunch of arrows in their quiver so that if they're talking to someone who's not yet pro-life, they can, you know, um, have an entry point to the conversation a variety of different ways. Uh, and, and so I think that's how the book is going to be most useful to, you know, people listening right now is that this will give you a much richer um, palette of colors for how to think about and how to talk about the abortion debate. Yeah, I should. Yeah. Mean, I think I think I forgot to mention the title of the book, actually. Okay. <laughs> uh, tearing, running like a finely oiled professional machine, as always. Tearing Us Apart is the title of the book to which uh, Ryan has just given us the subtitle. And, and in some ways, that goes to the heart of, 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 of the impact you see abortion having upon our culture. So thanks for that, uh, Ryan. Yeah. I thought I'd better correct my, my uh, faux pas there. Over to you, Tom. Um, well, you know, I, to our listeners, I, I was just i was telling the authors previously that that this is in in my opinion one of the very one of the very best books i've read on the subject and i've read a lot this is an issue i care about a lot and when i got my copy of this book and began reading it i i got very enthusiastic right away because i think just in terms of its apologetic heft i think pound from pound it it might carry more weight in terms of its um, apologetic persuasiveness than, than anything else th that I've read on abortion, both in, in terms of just straight content, but also in, in the way in which you all write. I mean, and, and part of, you know, part of the subtitle is, is that, you know, how abortion just, it doesn't help anything. And, and one of the points you make that's powerful is how abortion has corrupted, um, the medical industry and our, our thoughts about healthcare, which is a scary thing. Um, and I wonder if you all could just speak to that for a minute. Um, you know, the, the, the impact that this has had on, on the, the medical profession and how we, how we think as Americans about healthcare. Sure. I'd, I'd be happy to speak to that. Mm -hmm. And, um, thanks for your kind words about the book. I should give a shout out to my husband here who not only picked the alcohol that, that Carl has praised so highly <laughs> to bring as a gift, but also did, I think about 30 pages of, of footnotes for the book. So it's really mm research um is there we wanted readers to be able to to follow yeah. kind of the paper trail and do their own 
um, reading if they you know don't just want to take our word for it to really be able to to read up on all of it. But um, to the healthcare point specifically, something that we hear a lot in the abortion debate from the you know the Planned Parenthoods of the world is this is women's health care. Why are you trying to take health care away from women? But if you look at what the procedure is, you can't find a single doctor who will you know, explain why it's actually medically necessary to perform an abortion. It's never medically necessary to kill an unborn child, no matter, you know, what the the situation might be. You can always treat both the mother and the child as a patient. Um, and yet this is sort of how abortion was sort of kind of smuggled into polite society by a, a minority of doctors. And we really, we dig into that history of how, um, you know, most doctors even today are pro-life. Very few OBGYNs want right. to perform abortions. It's something that kind of the the losers of the, uh, the right. OBGYN profession will go into. Um, but this was kind of the the lie that was told to normalize abortion, right? Mm-hmm. To pretend that this was somehow medical care, um, and so that's why you're. It's very very difficult to find anybody who can explain or will try to even explain why killing direct killing of a, a you know healthy human being or even you know not healthy human being is some somehow care, right? You don't solve mm-hmm. medical problems by by killing. Yeah, and you know it's interesting. Um, you know the 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 now very infamous case out of Philadelphia with Kermit Gosnell. Um, it, you know, it, it's, it was unusual in the fact that it actually gained some media attention, not nearly as much media attention as it should have gained, but it actually did get, did get some media attention. Um, but what struck me about that, um, case, and I, I read a lot about it was how, while some of the things he did were, were yucky. Um, I'm, I was hard pressed to find much of what he did that probably doesn't happen in a lot of abortion clinics. Is is that reasonably accurate for me to say? Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. And 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 again, that that someone in you know a, a supposed healthcare provider um, would would take such unnatural liberties with with life is is a disturbing thing. And I think, Alexandra, to your point that kind of it's it's not the top tier OBGYNs that, that go into performing abortion. It's just not. It, it It's these it, it's a sketchier crew most most typically. Yeah. The, the only other thing I would add to what Alexandra said is that you can also see how by the medical uh, professional associations um, more or less um, contorting themselves to support abortion, it's then led to a whole host of other bioethical problems yeah. um, that we've lived through. And, you know, some of my cr- previous work on um, cloning, on embryonic stem cells and embryo destructive research, um, uh, I'm giving a lecture tomorrow night in Washington, D.C. on assisted suicide titled The mm-hmm. Lethal Logic of Assisted Suicide. Even some of the transgender stuff, right? Because what, what right. all all of this does, it says there's no normativity to nature, Mm-hmm. And that the unborn child in the womb doesn't have value. Well, if the unborn child in the womb doesn't have value, why does grandma or grandpa have right. value if they have dementia? Um, if the unborn child and the claim that his or her bodily presence makes on us doesn't have some value and normativity, why does my embodiment as male have any right. bearing? Right? I mean, and so you can actually see that to a certain extent, the acceptance of abortion within the medical profession really opened a floodgate uh and, and you know we we uh, now i can't remember if we quote leon cass or not if if this part you know zan is shaking her head this part that got cut out but you know in a in the when harry became sally book we i i know i do quote this because it's relevant to both discussions but what he what he has pointed out and for people who don't know leon cass he was um the first director of president bush's presidential council on bioethics longtime professor at the university of chicago uh, an MD, PhD, and he's a humanist who's thinking about medical science. And he points out that we've um, we've debased the profession of medicine, where you know professionals hold themselves out to certain ideals, they profess certain ideals to make it just another contractual mm-hmm. relationship where there's a customer uh, and there's a supplier. And doctors, I, I think the image he uses is that they're just a highly competent syringe or a highly wow. competent um, scalpel. Mm. And, and his point is that it's now morally neutral, whereas like yeah. historically medicine was a profession devoted towards healing and wholeness. And so both abortion, assisted suicide, all the gender, uh, transgender stuff, mm-hmm. it's all just making it like a choose your own adventure novel right. where the medical profession is now a amoral 
um, practice that yeah. can be turned to whatever ends the customer wants. Yeah. And that fundamentally corrupts the practice, the profession of medicine. Yeah. And that points in some ways to a sort of broader problem, because one of the things that's emerged since uh, the Supreme Court sent the issue back to the states is the states aren't, don't look as if they're going to deliver quite what pro-life people would, would, would want yeah. delivered. And, I mean, we were talking about this at the retreat, the EPPC retreat the other week. So many of the issues, the current moral issues facing uh, the United, not just the United States, but the, the West in general, uh, they're not issues that ultimately come down to arguments that people believe. They come down to what Charles Taylor calls the social imaginary, or they come down to intuitions. They come down to instincts. It's interesting that as soon as a row is overturned, suddenly abortion is all about 10 and 11 year old girls who've been raped by their fathers, whatever, and are now pregnant. And these are heartbreaking stories. You know, when you hear those stories, yeah, you're in, you know, it's easy to be pro-life when you're dealing with abstractions. It's much harder when you have concrete cases. What do you think strategically the pro-life movement needs to do? You know, and one, it's easy to win the legal argument because laws deal with abstractions. When people vote, they're voting in accordance often with imagination and intuitions. How do we transform the imagination of the culture in a sufficient way that will begin to, to deliver? Uh, do you have any comments or any thoughts on that? It must be something you wrestled with a lot. Yeah, this is this is one thing we really were trying to do with the book is how to take take the argument beyond just this. I think in my in my view, the pro life movement has had a very myopic focus on the unborn child, and of course, that's the fundamental harm of abortion, right? Mm -hmm. We have to start there that that an innocent child's life is lost or taken in every abortion. But unfortunately, we've now been saying that for fifty years, and a huge number of Americans aren't convinced. And I think it's. Right. For precisely the reason you just mentioned, right? It's not people aren't looking at this in clear cut philosophical, ethical, moral terms, even they just have sort of an emotional gut reaction or an instinct about it. And that's how they form their views. That's how they vote. Um, and so the rest of our, our book is looking at here are all the ways it's actually harmed all of us, right? Here's the way that that having legalized abortion or socially acceptable abortion has actually damaged not only our whole society, but specifically the very people it was supposed to help, right? The argument was always abortion would be a good thing for women. And so in my view, to kind of answer your question, though, I think it's a, a much bigger and more complicated thing to try and solve than just this. But I think we have to really change our language around this or, or refine it to focus a lot more on how abortion is bad for women um, and how abortion far from kind of solving the fact that men abandon women or, or women are left uh, pregnant and alone um, and therefore want to turn to abortion, is abortion actually good for women, right? Is abortion really a solution to the fact that women are left alone? Of course not, right? It is women then turning and committing violence against their own child as a, a means of trying to be free or happy or equal. Um, and I think just even saying that out loud, that doesn't sound like real freedom or equality or, or flourishing for women. Um, and so I think learning to kind of speak in those terms and, and uh, you know, try to convince people or help them see that, that abortion is not a victory for women is going to be a huge part of, of speaking to what you just raised. And I would um, say, actually, that one of the things I loved about the book was the number of specific stories you give that really does put faces onto to the concept. Sorry, Ryan, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. But oh, no, no, not at all, because I, I, I was going to head in that direction of saying that, you know, we we, we open the book, uh, the very close of like the introduction is actually an obituary mm -hmm. that um, he wasn't yet one of our colleagues. He now is one of our colleagues that Eric Niffin had written for his son, um, who was born with um, profound disabilities, um, and then you know on the at the and then at the end and uh, end of the book we we talk about you know promoting the the beauty of kind of family life and children, and, and both of those are there intentionally saying even when you have a child with profound disabilities it's still a blessing, and you know Eric's son brought great joy and fulfillment and blessings to the rest of the family, and his passing was was tragic and heartbreaking. And, you know, some of the stats that we point out like halfway through the book are that people who are given diagnoses of children with disabilities and then they're counseled to have the abortion, it actually shows that those who carry um, their children to term, even if they're going to die within minutes of giving birth, are actually much more psychologically and emotionally satisfied yeah. uh, with the outcome than those who have the abortion. Yeah. Uh, the reason I mentioned this is I think that just in general, we do not do a good job either of um, showing sometimes the joy and the beauty of real difficulties, that it's not all 
difficulty and bad that actually there are kind of redemptive aspects of suffering. Um, and we also don't do a good enough job of um, promoting the joys of just ordinary family life. And obviously, ordinary family life is never ordinary. It's always a mixture of suffering and joys and challenges and, um, you know, it's easy periods. Um, and so I think there's a huge role here, um, Carl, to your question about the social imaginary uh, for people who don't have the skills that Alexandra and I have, or, or who have skills that we don't have, they have additional uh, skills. And, and this is going to be the movie makers, the TV producers, mm -hmm. songwriters. I mean, uh, social imaginaries are not formed necessarily um, by academic books right. or even popular books. You know, they're formed or even by in movies, Washington TV shows. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Very last thing I'll say, I'm a student of Robbie George. I guess technically I'm not. I never took a course with Robbie George, but I'm a protege of Robbie George's. And obviously I believe in the natural law. I think it's real. I think God's told us that the natural law is real. There's a law written on the heart. I don't think you can have a natural law only culture. And we've never really had a exclusively natural law mm -hmm. culture. The natural law needs to be embodied yes. inside of religious traditions and religious communities. And you have to have a relationship with the natural law giver if you're going to embrace and live out the natural law. And so, you know, at the very end of the book, uh, we say that, look, it just strikes us two things are necessary. We have to respond comprehensively to the sexual revolution. You can't have a sexual revolution, social imaginary, and have a culture of right. life. Those things are fundamentally opposed. And I don't think, um, ultimately, while we, while we can make, and the first chapter of the book makes, you know, a secular, natural law, pro-life philosophical argument that, you know, can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Peter Singer about killing mm -hmm. the unborn. And we can win that debate. That um, needs to be embodied in a larger religious uh, revival. But I just think ultimately, you also while, while the while the secular argument is valid, it's not going to be persuasive when it requires self sacrifice, unless it's part of a larger eschatological vision in Absolutely. which suffering can have redemption. And so, so you know, we say we need to combat sexual revolution. We got to have a third great awakening. Um, don't ask me how we get those things, but they they need to be on the to do list. You need to read Charles. True. Charles Finney explains how to get a great awakening. <laughs> no, read that don't do that. Those principles. He's he's not the best person that Protestants ever produced. But, uh, <laughs> That's Carl, very true. Um, and 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 I, I I'll just you know as as we start to kind of head home on this. I, when I was a young pastor, I pastored a church in Wichita, Kansas, which was ground zero for a, a major oh. abortion battle, and um, yeah. the notorious now late um, George Tiller. Um, was one of the most well-known, notorious late-term abortion providers in the country. Um, yep. People would would come from all over the United States. He had a, he'd fly him in. He had a taxi service. They'd go back and forth from his clinic, and there was a a, a pro-life medical clinic that opened up right next door to him. the the direct The general director and the medical director and two of the nurses were members of the church where, that I served, and and so I was brought in frequently to deal with with couples who came into that clinic some of them were christian some of them weren't they they weren't sure if they wanted to do abortion or not but they had a a baby with some sort of a fatal anomaly so they knew it wasn't going to live long and they had thought well we'll just get an abortion but then they they went to this clinic first just to get another opinion and they ended up being persuaded to bring the baby to term for 9 years every family i worked with some of whom i maybe met with twice others who ended up becoming members of our church, not a single time did one of those couples ever to the slightest degree express regret for bringing that child to term without a single exception. It was, it was amazing to see the gratitude they had that they made the decision to bring the child to term. There was a blessed kind of closure for in terms of going, they could sleep at night. They treated their baby with dignity and, and without exception in those, in those delivery rooms, we, we grieved, but, but there was a, um, a peace and there was a healing to it for those grieving parents. They were allowed to grieve that child, but to have the peace to know that they, they made the slightly more well, what they first thought would have been a more costly decision. It ended up being the more liberating decision to bring that child to term. And after nine years of watching that without ever seeing a single exception, I was never more persuaded than ever that, that these poor souls that go through with an abortion are robbed of that. 
that they, mm-hmm. they, they're robbed of that. They're robbed of that. They're lied to about it and, and they miss something. And um, so that was a, a, such a telling experience for those nine years. And I'm so glad mm-hmm. you shine a light on that in the book. And I just want to commend to our listeners um, uh, th- this book, Tearing Us Apart. It is an excellent, um, it, it does several things at once that are really good. It'll give you history of the movement, but but most of all, it engages um, graciously, but very clearly in an apologetic way. If you want to be better equipped um, to have meaningful conversations, to hopefully help persuade people that you care about who are pro, pro-abortion, to do it in, in an effective manner, this book will really help to equip you to do that. It will also move you um, in ways that we need to be moved um, on this thing. Again, this is not strictly, I mean, policies are really important in this, but something has to happen in our hearts. And um, uh, the, the the authors do just an outstanding job, and uh, we want to thank them for their work. So again, um, uh, the book is Tearing Us Apart, How Abortion Harms Everything and Solves Nothing. Uh, the authors are Ryan Anderson and Alexandra DeSanctis, and we are grateful for their work. If you would go to our website, uh, mortificationofspin.org, you can enter to win a copy of this book. We would encourage you to do that. I can tell you people do win books. Um, I, I had like just a couple weeks ago, somebody from our church came up to me and said, I want a copy of the book. So it actually happens. That was um, a fix. If, you, if they're at your church, that's <laughs> it's a, a total, total <laughs> fix. I arranged it. I arranged it. Nobody no in my church it. ever wins them. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. If if you don't win a copy of the book, go to Amazon or, you know, who, who hates Ryan Anderson and, <laughs> um, and, and get this book. Uh, it will be worth having, um, and uh, something for you to read. It'll equip you. And we would encourage you to do that. If you're there, if you're at our website and you want to make a contribution to the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals so that we can continue to provide you with sleeveless t-shirts, please do that. And uh, we look forward to being with you next time. Thanks for listening to Mortification of Spin, a podcast of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. For more on topics like this, visit mortificationofspin.org, where you can find other articles by Carl and Todd, browse the archive of past episodes, and make a donation. We'll talk to you next time on Mortification of Spin. Mortification of Spin.